Okay, welcome back everyone. So we're gonna continue with our theme of subsurface water ice in the next two talks. Uh, the first will, will be on radar observations of the lunar poles by Catherine Nish, and the second is given by Tony Kolopreet on uh, the results from the LCROSS experiment. So we'll start with Catherine, who's a member of the MINIRF radar team on LRO. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Paul said, I'll be talking about uh, sort of giving an overview of radar observations of the lunar poles. Um, I've been heavily involved in the, the MINI-RF instrument on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, but there's been many different and wonderful radar observations of, of the lunar poles throughout the decades. Um, this is actually, this is not a radar ob <laughs> image, obviously, but it is one of my favorite views of the South Pole. That's that Shackleton crater right there, um, and then Earth in the background taken by the Kaguya spacecraft. It's a beautiful image. Um, so the two main points that I want you to take away from this talk, um, and this is why radar is such a great uh, instrument for detecting lunar volatiles, uh, are two things. One, radars are active instruments. Um, so unlike a lot of other instruments, you bring your own power source, making them capable of seeing in the dark. And as we know, uh, these ice deposits tend to live in permanently shattered regions, so it's good to have a flashlight to illuminate uh, the PSRs. Um, and the second thing, uh, is that ice has, uh, in particular, has some really interesting radar uh, properties that makes it really stand out. As we've seen um, some of the talks er earlier today on Mercury, you can see this wonderful uh, ice signature um, near the poles of Mercury, so it really stands out. And so this is what I'm going to cover uh, in this talk. So a lot of the instruments we've been hearing about up to this point uh, rely on external uh, sources of energy, uh, like the sun or starlight in the case of lamp or cosmic rays in the, in the case of neutron spectrometers. Um, you're, you have your detector here on board the spacecraft, but, but your source you don't have a lot of control over, um, which is unlike radar, uh, where, as I said, you bring your own, your own flashlight, your own radar flashlight, um, which you have complete control over. Um, it allows you to see into, into regions of darkness. Um, this here is, is what's known as a monostatic uh, configuration, where you're transmitting and receiving at the same place, uh, in this case on board uh, my, my version of LRO uh, in its polar orbit, <laughs> my PowerPoint version, <laughs> very, very detailed. Um, we'll also be talking about a bistatic configuration uh, later on in this talk, and that would be where your, your transmitter and receiver are in two different places. Um, and this actually might be a better sort of way to, to look at ice, as, as, I, as I will uh, talk about later. Um, <clears throat> and here's just a nice little movie illustrating the, uh, the fact that, that Minirf uh, here, here on LRO is able to, to see in the dark. Um, we can, and actually most of our data was taken in the dark. Uh, LRO uh, camera, the LROC camera, took most of their data during the day when the sun was up, um, but they were unable to take data during the night, so we were able to um, to acquire basically all of our data at night. Um, and here we see a, a better rendering of LRO in this movie. So, th so that's point number one, we can see in the dark. Point number two, ice has really interesting radar properties. Uh, this is a figure put together uh, in an overview paper by Steve Ostro in 2006. And what we're seeing here is something called the circular polarization ratio, which I will explain uh, in a moment, uh, as well as the total radar albedo here on the y-axis. Uh, down here is, is most rocky surfaces in the solar system. Uh, here's the moon in particular, with low circular polarization ratios and low radar albedo. Pretty, pretty dull um, places um, in terms of this, this scale anyways. Um, and then what we're seeing here are the icy satellites uh, of Jupiter, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, as well as polar features uh, on Mars and Mercury. And you can see we're, we're just off the chart here. In particular, they have circular polarization ratios that are greater than one, so we're looking out here, um, and very bright radar albedos. Uh, <coughs> and this was unusual. People weren't really expecting this when they first saw this, and, and, and it took a few years to sort of get an explanation for why this is the case. So why is this so unusual? Well, it has to do with this property uh, that I showed in the previous slide, the circular polarization ratio. So what this is, it's a ratio, simple ratio, of the polarization that you transmitted versus the opposite polarization. So in many cases, uh, radars transmit in circular polarization. So you have a radar wave that's doing this. 
and then it hits the surface, and typically when it backscatters, it will change polarization. And so then you've got uh, a radar wave coming back to you at the opposite uh, polarization. For rough surfaces, you should have a random number of bounces. So some will flip to be opposite sense, some will flip twice and go back to same sense. Um, and so you should have roughly equal number of same sense versus opposite sense uh, polarization, which gives you a moderate to high CPR, but no more th than one. Um, it, it, it does not account for any circumstances where you can get more same sense than opposite sense. And indeed, um, most surfaces are, as we saw in the previous plot, are much, much less than one. So what we saw with the Galilean satellites, though, is this very high uh, circular polarization ratio, much, much greater than one. And people scratched their heads and said, what could be causing such an odd uh, uh, radar signature? And, and what we've sort of determined in the, in the you know, preceding decades um, is it probably has to do with a coherence effect. So, so in the case of ice, we have no backscatter. It's only forward scatter. So we have um, a radar beam going into ice, uh, scattering off voids, forward scattering off voids, and then turning around and coming back to the radar. And since there's no backscatter involved, the polarization never flips. It continues to be same sense the entire way through. Um, and so you only see same sense radar. You don't really see much of the opposite sense. In addition, you will have another radar wave going in, in the exact opposite direction. And so when they come back to the receiver, they will add coherently. And you'll get a very, very bright signal. Um, if you're anywhere um, off from this coherence angle, it will be basically nothing. You won't see uh, a bright signal. But, but when you have this, this circumstance with these two signals coming in, in equal and opposite directions, you will get a very bright coherent effect and a very bright same sense radar. And as we've been talking about this morning, you get beautiful maps that look like this. Um, so this is the North Pole of, of Mercury, as we've been, been seeing. And, and this is a same sense radar map. So, so I was saying that um, ice is a very high same sense return. That's what we're seeing here in these, in these craters. Um, <coughs> and, and this is what the Galilean look, satellites uh, as well look like. And as uh, Dave was talking about this morning, we now have very good evidence that um, these craters uh, are indeed filled with ice. Um, all of them are associated with areas of permanent shadow. Uh, the neutron spectrometer, uh, those results also point to, to ice. Um, so um, it's pretty cool that you know, an observation made uh, 20 years ago by a radar has now been confirmed by Messenger that there is indeed large amounts of water ice on uh, Mercury. But we're here to talk about the moon, not Mercury. Um, so what does the moon look like? Well, here is um, a radar image of the moon taken from the ground. So for many years, uh, we've been taking radar images of the moon from <coughs> Earth. Um, we're very fortunate in that the moon is the closest celestial body to us, so it's very easy to get um, nice high resolution uh, images of the moon at various wavelengths and so forth. Um, and here is a great example from Campbell et al. Um, you can see um, fresh craters with blocky ejecta here. But as we approach the poles, you'll see we run into a bit of a problem. There becomes more and more shadowed regions. Um, since the moon is synchronously rotating about the Earth, um, it's very difficult to see these uh, shadowed, uh, the poles from the Earth. You get shadow. Um, so you really need an orbital radar to see inside um, these, these areas. Um, here's another example of that. This is Shackleton Crater. Um, taken from the Earth. Um, they were able to see into portions of the permanently shadowed regions right here, but you can see there's quite a bit that was left hidden. And so this was sort of the motivation for getting an orbital radar to peer into these permanent shadow regions that hadn't really been studied very well in radar previously. And this is just another uh, image from Andy McGovern showing that while we are able to see uh, into some of these permanently shadowed regions, these red regions from Earth with radar, there still remains quite a bit of shadow. Um, and as I said, this is what uh, convinced people to say, hey, we really need an orbital radar. Let's, uh, let's launch these and, and get this going. So that started the MINI-RF project, which was launched actually on two satellites. Uh, the first uh, orbital imaging radar was launched on the uh, Indian Space Organization's Chandrayaan-1 mission, uh, which also had uh, M-cubed. You hear a lot about M-cubed, but you don't actually hear a lot about the radar that was on um, Chandrayaan-1. It was the other NASA-supported uh, instrument on that mission. Uh, so this was launched in November of 2008. It had a somewhat simpler radar. Uh, it was one, one wavelength, S-band, 12.6 centimeters, with a somewhat um, large resolution of 150 
50 meters. And it was called Forerunner because it was really a, a test case, a forerunner to the Mini-RF instrument that I'll talk about for the most part in this talk on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. But we did get some really nice uh, mosaics of the, of the lunar poles using Chandrayaan-1. Uh, here, here's the North Pole and the South Pole. Um, almost 90% of the poles were covered. Um, and so this was really our first view of what the permanently shadowed regions uh, near the poles of the moon look like. Um, quite a nice, nice image here. <clears throat> but as I said, the next year, um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter launched with a much more sophisticated radar, the Mini-RF radar, which you see here, uh, attached to the side of LRO, uh, amongst all the other instruments we've been talking about today, Diviner, Lola, Lend, and so forth. Um, and in addition to having the S-band wavelength at 150 meters, it also had a second wavelength at 4.2 centimeters and a much, much higher resolution here, a zoom mode at 15 meter resolution. So um, most of our data was acquired at, at S-band at, at 15 meters. So almost everything I'm going to show you from here on out is going to be in that uh, configuration. <clears throat> and MINIRF did, did a wonderful job. As I said, we, we had many opportunities to take data during the lunar night. Um, and in the process, was, we're able to cover almost two-thirds of the lunar surface, which we see here uh, in, this, in this map. And in addition, uh, because the, the poles were such a region of interest, uh, almost 99% of the poles were covered, which you, I'll show you in a little bit in a polar projection here in a second. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> but the other cool thing is that it was the first view of the lunar far side. So because of the synchronous rotation of the moon about the Earth, you can't, in addition to the poles, you can't see the lunar far side either. So all of this data here and over here is also brand new. So that was pretty cool. Here's Orientale uh, for reference. And for those of you not, uh, I, I've got it in the next few slides. It, this is the circular polarization ratio. Uh, and the color is zero is purple and red is 1.2. Um, so, so anything here in red is, is, this, is very high uh, CPR. So you can see a lot of these fresh craters here standing out. And just to orient you, for those of you not used to looking at things in radar, this is where we are on the moon. And, and here's the scale uh, that you just requested. Um, it's, it's a circular polarization ratio overlaid on, on, on um, total radar backscatter. Um, so that's what we're seeing right here. This is the North Pole. I've just pointed out a few craters you might be familiar with. Uh, this fresh crater at Exagoras. Uh, Perry near the, near the North Pole here. Um, and then this is what the South Pole looks like. Um, again, pointing out a couple of craters here. And what I want you to, to realize is this looks a lot different than the image of Mercury that I showed you earlier in this talk. The moon is not Mercury in radar. Um, so that's, that's point one to sort of take home. And why is that? Why is that the case? So fortunately, we do have some ground truth that we can uh, compare it to. Uh, as Tony will be talking about in the next talk, uh, we had the LCROSS mission, which impacted uh, Cabeus Crater in October of 2009. And it did, did detect uh, water ice, uh, as I think Tony will be talking about, um, at about five weight percent, but maybe this number has been changed in, in the meantime. Uh, so, okay. so. The moon doesn't look like Mercury, uh, but we know there is some water ice there. Um, so what, is it, what does this one particular area look like in radar? Um, well, it doesn't, again, it looks nothing like Mercury. Um, indeed, you probably even couldn't, couldn't even tell Cabeus was here if I hadn't outlined it in red here. Um, this is the area of permanent shadow right here, and this is where LCROSS landed approximately. Uh, data from Chandrayaan-1 on the left, data from LRO on the right. Uh, there are slight differences between the two spacecraft because they looked at the moon at slightly different incidence angles, so you, you, the radar return varies with, with incidence angle. Um, but again, there is no bright deposit uh, standing out in this permanently shadowed region. But this is kind of neat because this gives us some constraints on the volatiles that LCROSS discovered. Um, it is not in the form of a big skating rink. It is not a thick, pure deposit of water ice. Um, it is more likely uh, to be s dispersed in the regolith as small grains. Um, and, and basically, they just need to be smaller than about 10 centimeters um, for Mini-RF not to be able to see them. So, so this is sort of this idea of, of what I think the lunar volatiles, how they're distributed. They're just small chunks dispersed throughout the lunar regolith. Now, Does the radar even detect water ice? Yes. That was, that was my point with mercury, was that... I know. Yeah. Well, this is this is my point. Is is no, it looks like right? That's it. It looks 
Well, I'll be getting to that, but that is, that is something to sort of take away from this, is it's, it is not mercury. <laughs> Now, now the radar, uh, it's able to um, look down about two meters, so if there's, if there's thick, pure deposits of water ice down below about two meters, we wouldn't see them, but so. Shane, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering if you have a roadmap map of S-band. Yeah, like I said, all of these are gonna be S-band um, that I'm gonna be showing you. We do have a pretty good X-band mosaic of, uh, I think it's the North Pole, um, but we had some problems with the X-band um, radar. The other problem uh, that some the images aren't as, as good, the other problem with X-Band is it doesn't penetrate very far and it's much more sensitive to surface roughness. So uh, if you're looking for ice, your, your best bet is to use longer wavelengths like S-Band. <coughs> so as Andy pointed out, it doesn't look like there are many um, bright craters in, in radar, um, but there are a few um, of these anomalous craters where you have a very high uh, radar return within the crater, but not much going on outside the crater. Uh, this is one of my favorites in, uh, in Rostovensky near the North Pole. Um, we see these uh, actually in quite a few places in the North Pole. This is a paper by Paul Spudis. Every, every crater here circled in green is one of these anomalous craters. This is the, the map from Chandrayaan 1. Um, so we, we do see the interesting high CPR craters near the poles. Unfortunately, we also see them near the equator, too, so um, there aren't as many of them, but there definitely are craters that look like this near the equator, where obviously the, the bright return is not due to, um, not due to ice. Uh, so there's sort of this, this conundrum, um, and it's possible that the signal we're seeing in these anomalous craters is not actually due to water ice. It turns out there actually, there's another way to get high CPR that does not involve volatiles. Um, and that's extremely blocky um, surfaces. So this was the, the story I was telling you about earlier, where if you get multiple scattering, uh, it mixes up the polarization, you get equal amounts of same sense and opposite sense, and CPR is about one. But if you happen to have a surface with tons of little corner reflectors, you get a lot of double bounce, which uh, preferentially flips your polarization back to the same sense which you started with. And in this case, you can get a very high CPR, much, much greater than one without ever needing ice. Uh, a great example of that is SP flow uh, in northern Arizona. This has CPRs up to about two, and um, clearly there is no water ice here um, in, in northern Arizona. But, uh, but in, instead, it's just this rubbly, um, blocky lava flow filled with little radar-sized corner reflectors. Um, so it is possible to get high CPR without ever needing ice. Um, so that's sort of frustrating when you're looking at the poles of the moon. How do you tell the difference? So in the monostatic configuration, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between ice and blocks. Um, but in the bistatic configuration I was alluding to earlier, you, you might be able to. Um, so, so here's a new experiment that MINIRF is, is currently involved in, where we're transmitting from the Earth, from Arecibo, bounces off the moon, and then we receive it here with LRO. And this allows us to have this, this angle, this bistatic angle, uh, to be values uh, greater than around zero, which is all we've been able to look at the moon uh, up to this point. Um, and the reason why this is important <coughs> is because rocks will very likely have a very different uh, signature uh, in terms of the circular polarization ratio as you go out to different beta angles. Um, the coherence effect I was talking about ensures that um, once you go to, to angles much, much greater than two or three for ice, their signal will drop down and, and you, shouldn't see, uh, you should see a very low um, CPR value if, if you're talking about water ice. Rocks, uh, we expect, although this has never been measured, that um, it will be a much uh, slower drop off in terms of beta angle. So if we can characterize this curve um, and then look in the permanently shadowed regions, uh, we should be able to tell the difference between this, this uh, theoretical estimate about what water ice should look like compared to rock. So this is the experiment that MINIREF is currently engaged in. Um, the first step is to characterize that curve for rocks. This has never been done before. Um, these are the first um, bistatic images of another world, actually. This is a pretty cool experiment. Um, and here's Kepler Crater, which is nowhere near the poles, uh, but it does have a nice uh, blocky ejecta blanket. Um, and here's uh, some work that Wes Patterson is doing uh, and taking it. So this phase angle is, in this case, bistatic angle. Um, and you can look at the ejecta blanket here at different phase angles and then characterize what this curve looks like. So we're slowly building up uh, this, uh, this curve for, for crater ejecta and also for mare, 
So when we get images of the lunar poles, um, we can see if they look like this, like, like rocks, or whether they look like that theoretical prediction for water ice, which should drop off very quickly. Um, so that's the second step. Um, we're still engaged in this, uh, in this effort to get uh, nice images of the lunar poles. Um, as you can see, it's, it's difficult to get images of the poles, again, because of this, this shadowing uh, effect, um, since we have kind of a bad angle from the, from the Earth. Um, but there are definitely areas of permanent shadow that we should be able to see with, with MINI-RF in this configuration, and we can do the same experiment at the poles. But ideally, really what we want are, are, uh, is a two-spacecraft mission. Um, so instead of having this, this, uh, the transmitter stuck on Earth, where you can only look at it at very glancing angles, if you had a second spacecraft, you could transmit at a much better angle um, and then receive it at a, at a second spacecraft. Um, so this would be uh, an interesting mission to pursue um, that should be able to look right into these permanently shattered regions and get these, these curves, these CPR curves that, that I was showing earlier. Now this has been, this has been tried um, twice. Uh, the first time was uh, it, by the Clementine mission that transmitted uh, into the permanently shattered regions and then it was received on the Earth. Um, and and, it, and um, Stu Nazette and his team got an interesting result over Shackleton, where you see here's, here's bi-static angle of zero, and it does fall off quite um, quickly uh, with beta angle uh, compared to non-permanently shadowed regions, which look rather flat. Now, uh, the results here, I guess the analysis was somewhat controversial. Um, some other people suggested that you would not get the signal um, given this data. Um, so this remains somewhat uncertain. I can say that with MINI-RF, we don't really see much of a uh, high CPR sign signature at Shackleton. It looks just like a fresh, <laughs> rocky crater, in my opinion. Um, there's a, a paper by Brad Thompson on that topic uh, last year. Um, so, so it's unclear whether or not this is indeed an ice signature at Shackleton, but it was attempted. Uh, and then um, the real hope with having Chandran-1 and LRO up at the same time was that we could do this experiment with these two radars. Um, and this was attempted once um, in August of 2009, and due to some technical issues, uh, it, it, it did not work. Um, and unfortunately, Chandran-1 failed a couple weeks later, um, and so the experiment was never, we were never, never able to repeat that experiment. Um, but if, if, you know, in the future, if there were a mission with two radars, um, this would be possible. So anyways, I'm, just to wrap up, um, I think we all, we all agree that there is some uh, ice in the permanently shadowed regions on the moon, um, but uh, looking at Cabeus in particular, it seems like it might be present as, as in pretty small grains, at least not observable with radar, um, but uh, perhaps there are some of these small craters that do contain quite a bit of water ice, and if we can get some bi-static radar observations set up, we might be able to detect um, these large deposits of water ice. So thanks for your attention.